I saw someone is asking in the chat whether there will be a replay for tonight's talk. Uh, I believe the answer is yes. And one of the reasons uh, uh, Hugang took takes time out of his busy schedule to give this talk is because he has been asked by so many parents and so many friends to give this talk over and over again. Uh, so he decided that it's time to do this at a broader scheme so that it could benefit more of our Chinese community. And thank you, Gan, for doing that. All right, I think, wow, it's just, it's the clock just turned 9.30 and we have close to 200 people. This is amazing. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight for the Coffee Club Talk. And uh, we have a very, very good speaker tonight, Gan, to share with us how to get your job in the financial industry. So before we delve into tonight's talk, for those of you who are new to Chinese Coffee Club, I'd like to take a few minutes to give some quick introduction of uh, Chinese Coffee Club. It was founded four years ago and uh, it was uh, re formally registered in New York last year as a 501c3 nonprofit. It provides professional lectures and conferences for our Chinese community. And the vision is to provide collaboration and alliances among Chinese organizations for us to find a home outside of home. And Wisdom Academy as a sister organization of Coffee Club is established last year to provide high quality, practical and affordable financial and investment education for all, all ages. And there are also career training program, as well as job, in, job internships and coaching services. If, and if you're interested in learning more about WizWise Academy or Coffee Club, please scan the QR code at the bottom right of the, of the screen. There are so many different WeChat groups. Whatever your interests are, you will find one or more groups that will fit your interests. Just make sure you uh, take a picture of the QR code. We're going to share it later on as well, if you didn't get a chance now. Just a very quick introduction for the upcoming talks for the rest of the week. On Friday, we have Joy to share with us her journey for entrepreneurship. And then on Saturday, we have a talk on how to apply for colleges as an art student. And then on Sunday, we'll have a special shop AAPI event. It's about how do you, how to, could small enterprises to use e-commerce through the broadcasting a mechanism which is very popular in China. And uh, again, this is the QR code for both Wisdom Academy, uh, Wisdom Academy, as well as Coffee Club. So if you are interested in one or both, make sure you uh, scan and uh, reach out. A few more words on the Wisdom career training programs. There are energy le leadership coach group coaching program offered by Joy and Hope. There is Pass from Survive to Thrive program by Ivy. And there is also business writing uh, for an international professional that is uh, in the planning. And there are other programs as well. So make sure that uh, you can go to the website to check out all the different programs and find whichever ones that you're interested in and learn more details. And there is also, I want to just uh, reemphasize there, they offer a uh, financial internship as well. So for those who are still in schools or looking for internship opportunity. All right, so that's for the commercials. And it's my greatest pleasure and honor to introduce Hu Gang, tonight's speaker. He is a founder and CIO of Winshore Capital. And he was formal portfolio manager and Blue Crest portfolio capital management. And before that, he was formal managing director at Credit Suisse trading uh, rates and global inflation, and also executive VP at PIMCO. He has 20 years of experience in the financial market. And uh, he, he earned a B bachelor's degree from Tsinghua University and PhD from Caltech. I have had the opportunity to hear Gan talk about different topics in different uh, settings. And every time I listen to him, I learned a lot. And it's always, it's always, I always enjoy every minute of his talk. And uh, it, it's my greatest pleasure to present him tonight and hope you will learn a ton tonight. And the floor is yours, Gang. 
Okay, thank you so much. This is very flattering. It's um, a lot of pressure. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, um, thank our host and, and the Chinese Coffee Club and uh, Wisdom Academy to give us this um, platform um, to, to, to let me have this pr uh, plat you know, presentation. Um, like you just said, you know, I, this is not my job. I don't, I don't really do this for a living. I, I can't really, I'm not really professional to train youngsters. Um, what, what happens is in general, there are um, oftentimes family and friends ask me to give some advice to, um, you know, college kids or maybe, you know, first year graduate students um, in terms of, you know, how to land a job on Wall Street. Um, so I usually go over the whole spiel. It takes about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, over and over again, you know, it gets, gets old. And I, and I figure, you know, there, there's gotta be a better way to do this. So I, I call the engineer one day and say, look, um, can you help me, please? Um, I like to do a um, presentation um, to help more people, but more, also more importantly, um, if you can record it and eventually for next year, the year after, um, if people ask me, I can just you know, be, be lazy and send over the, the recording. So, so, so that was where to come from. Um, thanks everybody to join us. Um, hopefully I won't um, disappoint you. Um, I'm gonna go over um, the topic is really random walk uh, into a Wall Street job, but as a friend of mine point out, there's nothing random about it. The whole process will be, you, as you will see, it takes tremendous amount of work, huge amount of time, and almost an iron will to get it done. But the hope is you can definitely get it done. I mean, I think if you can go through the process and, 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 and take the, the hard work, um, you know, landing a job on Wall Street is hard, but it's definitely doable. Um, and I, I, I like to say it's actually high probability doable. So I'm gonna talk about in three sections. Um, the audience, I, I see that many of the audience are experienced people, experienced um, professionals. So, um, I want to apologize to beforehand, but you know, as, as I prepare this, it's usually I wanted to give an overview of financial market, financial servicing industry to um, college students, for instance, or first year graduate. Um, give them an over, overview on what financial servicing industry look like, what kind of jobs um, there are, and you know, all kind of jobs. Why is this? a remotely interesting um, industry. I know, I know many people now look at tech probably. It's much more um, advanced or, or, or more uh, fashionable. Um, so that, that, that's the first. I'll give an overview on financial industry, servicing industry. And secondly, I'm gonna talk about the key skill set that this industry is looking for. So th these are the skill sets for entry level person you need to have if you don't have, you need to prepare yourself to have. And usually the preparation time is at least six, six months to a year. It takes a long time, gradually, can't do it overnight, um, but you know, over the time, maybe six months to a year, you'll be able to do it. I've seen people do it um, hard, but you can, you can be prepared. And then with the skill set, I like to share a little bit of my own experience of being around for a long time. Um, even though myself, myself isn't very successful, but I've seen many very successful people. Um, by observing them, I like to share a little bit points of what are the traits of success um, if you were to um, make your name in the financial industry. Um, third, so first will be um, introductory for the financial market uh, in servicing industry. Secondly, um, the key skill sets, even you know, either the entry point skill sets or the de career development uh, skill sets. And then finally, I will go over um, in the, the, the job searching process. So the, the, the final meat of this presentation, you know, there's three steps. You gotta prepare the resume, you gotta do the networking, and then eventually how to prepare uh, interview process. Um, I won't be able to, um, the, the, the whole process is probably going to take between an hour and an hour and a half. 
So just to um, ensure that I can go over all the materials, um, I'm gonna leave all the questions uh, to the end. So let's start. The financial servicing industry. Um, a lot of uh, kids, when they come to me and the first question is, you know, what is finance? You know, what is, what is investment bank? What, what do they do? They all watch movie like The Wolf of Wall Street, The Billions, and, you know, the big shorts and, you know, look pretty exciting and, and, and most borderline criminal. Um, so, so they wanted to know, you know, am I going to go to jail for this or, or you know, am, is this just a place to make a lot of money and I can leave free? Um, the answer I usually give to them is, it's actually a very boring industry. If you think about it, it's just like any business. The business of financial servicing industry as of Wall Street or, you know, fund management industry, there's one key component. Everybody is working for that goal. That goal is to link savers to producers. It's all about lending and borrowing money. Everything about that is about lending and borrowing money. It's very naturally to think the society has that kind of need. A lot of people have savings. I'm pretty sure everybody in this, in this, in this talk has savings. And, and once, you know, but, and then also a lot of people, you know, have business to run. People open restaurants, people start manufacturing jobs, people start, you know, pharmaceutical companies. A lot of people have, great ideas, tech companies, right? But, you know, to start a comp to, to company, start a business, you need starting point, you need starting capital. Not only you need a starting capital, you actually need capital along the way. So where do you borrow these capitals? Where do you borrow the money to hire the people? Where do you borrow money to buy computers? Where do you borrow money to buy, you know, equipment? Or, you know, even to rent an office space. Um, in general, there are two kinds of it, uh, how people um, get money. One side is to go to a bank, you know, say, look, um, I need certain money. I wanted to borrow as a business loan. Um, that part certainly exists, but that is the business of commercial bank. So we're not gonna talk about this today. The commercial bank is really, you leave the money in banks like JP Morgan, Chase, Citibank as deposit. They use your deposit and they lend your money on their behalf. So if you, if the money, you know, the, 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 the debt becomes bad, they'll take responsibility for it, um, you're covered. But this is not what we're, what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the security market. So there are other kind of borrowing money is to generate something called a security. A security is really just a certificate or a piece of paper telling people, look, this is a proof that I have lent money to you. There are different uh, kinds of proof. In general, you know, the majority of them come from two. One is called bond. The bond is something that you lend the money to somebody else and you expect it to be paid back at certain date, three-year bond, you need to pay back in three years, five-year bond, you wanna be paid back in five years, or 30-year bond, you need to be paid back 30 years. Or stocks. Stocks is not, you don't need to pay back ever, but by having, giving the stocks, um, you, you needed to, um, you basically own part of the company. So the security business is where, you know, financial service industry in general, what we talk about Wall Street, are concentrated on. But the key is, it's a way to borrow money and lend money. So in terms of jobs, when we look at you know, financial servicing jobs, then I would further look at the process of borrowing money, the security. The first, there are two steps. The first step is when the security is born, so-called born as of introduced to the market. You know, Genku, I can, today I say, look, I need a hundred million dollars. Why don't you each give me a million dollars? 
you look at me and say, are you crazy? You know, why would, why would I give you that money, right? It's not anybody to can go on the market and borrow a hundred million dollars and then walk away. There are various, a lot of regulations, legal compliance to restrict who is able to borrow money in the security market. And in investment bank, there are a group of people called investment bankers or investment banking, um, investment banking uh, section. They are the people to help these producers to bring that security in the, into the market. As off, you know, for instance, Amazon. Amazon could do two things. Amazon could be issuing stocks. You know, years ago, they did that. They will sell the stocks to the market. Who helped them sell the stocks? A bunch of investment bankers. They helped them go over the regulatory proof, go through SEC, go through all the, you know, um, announcement, all the disclosure, so that to make sure the investors' interest are protected in the way. And once they do that, the investors then allow, and Amazon then allow to sell their stocks to the market, and in fact, selling a piece of their company to the investors, and the investors can buy them. Amazon can also issue debt. Amazon can go to the market and say, look, I don't want to give a piece of my company away. I only want to borrow money for five years. But then investment bankers also work with Amazon and they need to figure out, is Amazon able to pay back that money? You can't take the money and run. So all this legal process, all this compliance process, all the regulatory process needs to be go over. And then the investment bankers, once they have all this, they then need to go and find investors. The initial investors, either IPO or the initial investor for the banks, to, for the bonds, to buy these securities. So this whole process is when securities are introduced to the market, what we call primary market activity. Primary market activity. So that's primary market activity is when something, a borrowing and lending practice went to public, went to the market, the security is born. So overall, the investment bankers are the ones who deal with this. They bring the security to the market. Now, of course, there are, before the IPO, these days there are VC, there are SPACs, there are uh, private equity. I'm not gonna get into too much into this, but you know, these are the, um, a, 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 a more peculiar cases of lending money and joining in and taking share of the company at early stage. But the majority of the financial market servicing industry is focused on a public debt or public stocks. And they trade a, a far higher proportion than that. So that's first the primary market. What's involved? Investment bankers. Investment bankers help the producers bring this certificate or bring this security to the market and find investors to buy. Once the security is born, then we move to the second step. The second step is called secondary market trading. That's a much bigger and active uh, activity in the market. So in general, when you look at you know, the big shorts or you look at the billions and these people buying stocks and bonds, those are all in the secondary market. Those are mostly after the market, the security is introduced to the market. So in that case, why there needs to be a secondary market? Because whoever invested, let's say, you know, 20 years ago when as, as Amazon, I don't know, actually Amazon went, when they went public, but let's say 20 years ago when you bought Amazon stocks and you made a lot of money. You know, you invested $10,000, now you're worth, you know, 100000 or more. But now you need to buy a house. You can't give your Amazon stocks to the, 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 the seller of the house. He needs cash. So what you do is you need have the need to sell this Amazon stocks to the market. And that's why there's this thing called secondary market trading, secondary market activity. So in the secondary market activity, this, these are a far bigger um, group of people involved. In general, we talk about buy side and then sell side. 
That's these are the two concepts being introduced here. Okay, what are the differences? The buy side are the people who have cash, who needs to invest, who buys things and then they hold it. They can buy a bond, take the coupon, take the get the principal payback, buy the stocks to take the dividend to enjoy the appreciation or you know suffer the depreciation. So that's buy side. Buy side could be mutual fund, could be hedge fund, could be endowment, could be sovereign wealth fund, or could be insurance companies. So those are people that's buy side, what we call it. They're, they are the investors. So they could be the first group of investors and they you know, can still be active in the secondary market. So these are the investors. When they buy in security, they hold it. They make a call, they hold it for a period of time. Then there's sales side. What are the sales sides? Sales side are banks. In general, when you see JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, oftentimes they are the banks. So there's such a law and, and when sales side, so there's such a law in the United States in general, it's very rare that buy side can sell a security to another buy side for legal compliance regulatory reason. For instance, if I start a fund and you start a fund, a stock worth hundred dollars and all of a sudden I decided I'm gonna sell it to you at $10. Didn't I just give you $90 of gray money and being very hard to, 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 um, to find out? So if a buy side started trading against buy side, things lose control. So oftentimes the law decides you cannot, the investors cannot trade directly against investors. The investor in general needs to find a common place that trade at a common price. So oftentimes these banks are the ones in the middle and they are the middle when they buy a security. Like remember, I just said, when the, when the, when the buy side buy a security, they hold it, they enjoy the security, they enjoy, they get the coupon principles and, and dividend. But when the sell side people buy a security, all they wanna do is to find another guy so that they can sell the security too. So they're the middle, they're in the middle. And what they eventually do, it's a very interesting point if you can picture. There are only 20 to 30 global banks. You can name it, you know, US, JP Morgan, Citibank, BOA, Wells Fargo, uh, Europe, BMP, Deutsche Bank, Barclays. There are probably 20 to 30 of these in the middle that faces thousands of buy side firms. So not only they are the transaction point of things that transact, they are also the information center when everything happens. That's why I always, if you're a college graduate or um, you know, first year graduate, your first job, I highly recommend go to sales because sell side, you can learn a lot. You will see a lot, you will learn a lot. You might not be able to put exactly risk if you wanted to take risk, but it will give you the basic training of taking risk, of understand the market, understand market behavior, understand market participants, because 20 to 30 of you are in the middle to face thousands of buy side firms. Now in the sell side, what are the jobs that people do in sales? Um, their front office, the difference between front office and middle, middle and back office. The front office, simple, sales, trading, research. And middle and back, IT, risk, um, compliance. Um, so sales, trading, research. Trader is very simple. You know, that's very straightforward. Like I said, Amazon, some client wants to sell Amazon. Um, they will just sell to a trader and the trader will find another person trying to sell this to. And by the, by the way, these days, trader does not always mean a human. They're oftentimes machines. 
But even for machine, there are also quantitative people or quantitative programmers or quantitative researchers behind the machine to maneuver that machine. So trading, these people, I, I put all of them as traders. They're risk takers. You know, what they do is they, the investors look at the stock at hundred dollars, they'll buy them. But if you go to a bank, this thing worth a hundred dollars, he wouldn't sell you at a hundred dollars. He'll probably say you at a hundred and, and hundred point one. If you need to buy it, they probably buy at 99.9. .9. So he charges 20 cents as his pay off his work. But it's not that simple, right? You know, when a client sells a stock to a market maker, either a machine or a person, the market maker look at the price, $100. Okay, I buy 99.9. .9. Great, you're gone. So the stock come to you, all of a sudden something happened that stock was $80. You just lost $19.9. So you just lost money for the firm and that's firm's money. So the trader's job, not only is the facing crime, but also managing risk. That's trading. Sales, by the way, once you're in the sell side trader for a period of time, oftentimes the trader goes on to buy side to become portfolio manager. Now, you look at price, you look at value, you can start, you're trained to understand the market, then you can move on to the buy side. Sales. Sales in general are the marketers for the trader. Like I said, you know, you have 20 to 30 uh, banks, you're facing thousands of funds. When I was a PIMCO, I have, you know, trading relationship with 20, 30 banks, all of them. So who do I decide if I need to do a trade? Who do I call? which trader I will allow them to make this bid and offer. I will give them a chance to provide a service to me and therefore I pay them. It's almost like when you go to a restaurant, which you, you, you wanna have dinner, you have many restaurants to, to choose from. They are all competitors. So salespeople are the ones who deal with clients, who bring the clients into the door so that the client trade with the, the bank and in which banks take gets two things. Banks charge bid and offer, and bank get your information. So again, banks, that's the information center. That's why it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. The more salespeople can bring it to you, the more you have to understand the puzzle, the puzzle of the market. Why did market move? You see every flow, you see everybody's reaction. So that's sales. Now research, research serves two purposes. Research does not deal with client directly, that does not cover client, do not cover client directly, and research do not um, cover um, um, trading, do not take risk. But um, research do two things. Number one, research look at trading and tell them, this is good risk, this is bad risk. They provide a service, they, help the traders to determine what kind of risk they need. At the same time, research could also help sales to talk to their client, to channel their client's work, to lead their clients to come to their, because if I were a PIMCO, I want to buy something. And then all of a sudden, you know, if, if one salesperson, sales force of one of the banks, bring a research to me, researcher to me and tell me, okay, this is the things that you want to buy. And this is, the dynamic of this security. This is the pros and cons of the security. Of course, I have to pay them back. Of course, I'm gonna try to reward this work, even though I don't pay actually pay money to him. He works for the bank, bank pays him. Bank pays his bonus, pays his cash, whatever. But I have, to, I feel obligated that I will need to go to this bank to give them the business. And not only do I need to give them business, I might give him exclusive business, meaning, 20 to 30 banks. Usually if I want to sell something, I'll find three guys say, okay, bid, 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 bid this. So everybody give me a price and I transact with the highest price person. But if a research person shows up, give me that idea. I might feel obligated. I can only go to him and say, look, put a price on it. If it's roughly okay, you're done. So the bank will charge better bid offer, better margin for that. 
So that's research. So sales trading research, those are three integrated components of front office. Now back office, middle office is becoming increasingly important. And everybody knew like this, uh, I still couldn't pronounce that, that, that firm and this Bill Huang um, guy, uh, thank God he's not Chinese somehow, you know, um, and he cost billions of dollars from these banks. That's purely because risk compliance completely let it lack, lacked. Now IT is the one who makes sure the system works. Risk is make sure the, the trader understand risk in the, with a boundary. You know, the risk manager, do not tell a trader, you should buy this, you should buy that. This is a good risk, this is bad. No, the risk manager come to trader and say, look, this is your boundary. You're not supposed to step out of it. As long as you're within the boundary, you can do whatever you want. But if you're outside the boundary, you need to address it or you need to be fired. That's how powerful it is. When I was young and naive, I had numerous amount of fights against risk people. And I never won any fight, never ever. And oftentimes it, 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 it turned out they're right. You know, I, I, I thought I was too young, too naive and, and too um, arrogant for the lack of better words. Um, compliance also, you know, these days in, the, in, in, in Wall Street, um, many things you cannot do, many things you cannot say, um, you know, they used to say, if, if things that you say cannot be put on the first, first, first page of Wall Street Journal, just don't say it. Um, you know, it's more, more and more like true. So, um, but this being said, even though they are crucial, crucial part of the firm, IT risk and compliance, if you're 22 years old, I suggest try your best to get on the front office because Look, you're 22 years old. You have plenty of time. The, 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 the thing that probably, I don't even care you succeed or you fail. The saddest thing for a 22 year old is probably to be able to see themselves in the next 25 years. You want uncertainty. A life when you're 22 years old, a life with certainty it's probably the same as death. So take some risk. Now, um, I wanna address a little bit. So now I, in general, talked about, you know, the financial servicing industry. And, you know, the question generally is um, not really, not many people wanted to go to finance anymore. It's not a fashionable um, area. People wanna go to Facebook, Google, and, you know, all that um, fancy stuff. I still think finance industry has its charm. Um, I think there's three things for me that really brings home why I wanted to, why this is the only industry I want to, I want to work. By the way, you know, when I graduate, um, you know, this is really, I'm, I'm, I'm really old. When I graduated, it was 1999, 2000. I went to Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street, similarly, had a very hard time to recruit good people uh, because Silicon Valley is, really, really hot, was really, really hot. And I looked at myself, I was like, I don't see myself as a programmer. I don't see myself as, um, the reason I didn't go was exactly, I want uncertainty. I, I you know, for, 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 the, for, for the very limited vision that I had, and it probably completely wrong was, I thought if I go to Silicon Valley and become a programmer, my life would be just like that. I'll be programming all day long, uh, programming for the next 20 years. And then, so what? I don't want, I wanted to have some more excitement. And I got it. So why finance is still interesting? I think there's three things that make finance very interesting. Number one is scalability. The business of financial servicing industry is incredibly easy to scale, scale up. What is scaling up? So take an example, you open a restaurant, right? Open a restaurant, you wanted to, um, um, you know, you rent a place, put a bunch of table and chairs, get a cook, uh, get a chef, um, find a bunch of waiters, 
uh, serve people food. Turned out to be very successful. So now you want to open the next one. If you're going to open the next one, you go through the same thing again. You find a place, you rent a place, you buy a bunch of table and chairs, you need to find another chef, you need to find a bunch of waiters. So of course, you have two restaurants, assuming you're successful, you doubled your revenue. The money you make every night, double. But it also doubled your cost. So effectively, when you open a restaurant, in the restaurant business, when you scale up, your, your, um, your profit only double when you scale up because you have to pay twice as much as the cost, roughly, and you earn twice as much of money. So your profit only double. In finance industry, that's very much not the case. So let's say an investment banker, a group of investment bankers working on a, you know, IPO, bring the company to, to public. And it's a $100 million company, so you raise the $100 million. Usually you take a, a percentage cut, you know, let's say it's 3%. So all of a sudden this group of people, they work hard, bring this company to, to, to public, you make $3 million. Good, good for a few weeks of payday, right? Or work. But consider this, if it's a company of $10 billion, do you need, so it's sort of like a hundred times bigger. Do you think I need a hundred times more bankers to work on it? I guarantee you not. I might have like twice as many, as many bro bankers to work on, maybe even the same amount. So all of a sudden, I'm earning $300 million for the same amount of people. That is called scalability. When I was a PIMCO, our fund was $100 billion. Every year, we, the management fee was probably close between $300 to $500 million. And you know how many people are managing it? Three. Three PMs manage $100 billion. Now, if that's $10 billion, you know how many people it takes to manage them? Probably three. So finance service industry is one industry. If you do it well, you can scale up like crazy. That's why upside downside, it's a lot of risk. Just think about this Bill Huang person. He single-handedly bore down all these banks by himself. The cost of losing money, well, there's also a cost of losing money, didn't change. He just takes so much debt, bet. So that brings me to the second one. The scalability brings in a very much excitement in your lifestyle. You're excited. You're facing something. You can make an impact. You're 23, 24 years old. You're making millions for the firm. And if you're 27, 28, you could be running a desk, trading desk, a sales desk. Of course, you know, um, by the time you're 40, 45, you have to think very differently. But you're 22, 23, go for it. The third, so first, scalability. Second, excitement. The third is pers my personal favorite is the intellectual challenge. I think finance industry give me, at least, the best intellectual high ever. Now, why do I say that? I always like to compare the financial industry to a natural science department. Let's say when I was at Caltech, you know, I was working on something. The natural science in that case, it's like, okay, you see a tree out there. The tree grow leaves, the leaves grow on the tree in spring, and then the leaves fall uh, in autumn or fall. So scientists are very curious about it. Why does this happen? They go to this tree and study it, 
and they find out. Fantastic, the scientists are very happy. But no matter the scientists find out or not finding out, that tree will continue to grow, the leaves will continue to grow on the tree and continue to fall from the tree. So the action of these scientists does not change and the study of these scientists does not change the subject that they study. That to me, oftentimes is natural science. Financial market is very different. I'll give you one example. The hottest topic these days is the physical policy of the, um, the financial market, is the physical policy of the Biden administration. The number keeps growing, two trillion, four trillion, and nowadays it's probably six trillion, whatever the number becomes. Now the market takes this and study it. The financial market will study this, and the prevailing view of the financial market was, this is going to generate inflation. If this generates inflation, what's going to happen? The Fed or the Federal Reserve is going to act. The central bank needs to act to curb inflation, to help bring down inflation because price will go up too much. If the Fed needs to kill inflation, then what in general what happens is the Fed will kill economy. So what you all often will see very strangely is that on one hand, the government is gonna spend $6 trillion by charging uh, tax from the rich people so that you take money from the corporation, it will generate inflation, make the central banks more hawkish, which eventually will probably bring down the stock market. So assuming this is the logic and assuming the stock market goes down 10 to 20% because of this, what's gonna happen is that will, the policymaker will see this and they will change their tone of that $6 trillion. So the market will study a subject. And once the market have made a decision on what's going to happen, that subject in itself will change. So the action of studying will change the subject itself. And therefore, to me, this is, incredibly fascinating because you're not looking at a static process. You're not looking at something that is gonna be the same today and tomorrow. Everything I do changes everything else. You see all this butterfly every day, the butterfly impact of one place you have a butterfly, the other place have a tsunami. You see that in financial market all the time. It's linked by a group of feedback loops, dynamic systems. And they interact with each other. Some of them self-fulfilling, some of them self-defeating. And they keep on interacting with us, with each other. There's almost no way you can solve a dynamic system, but you can always try. So every day you wake up to a brand new world and you never know what's gonna happen today or tomorrow or next week. You always, all you know, it's gonna be fresh. It's gonna be new. It's gonna be exciting. So to me, that is why it's understand, it's, it's to me is the most interesting part of doing this job. As of you are seeing something and then you see the impact of this thing and then the impact itself will change the subject itself. It never ends. So these three things, scalability, excitement and intellect, inte intellectual challenge those are the three things I think make finance smart financial jobs still very, very attractive, at least to me. So that's the first part. Talk about um, financial industry start structure. Um, the second, I'm gonna talk about, you know, hopefully if you're still listening, um, I guess you're interested. So what are the key skill sets to get into this? And what are the key skill sets or key traces to lead to a success. There are four things. In fact, I steal this from somebody, steal this from Bill Gross. 
my boss. There are four things that people do. Number one, drive. You really need to want this job. You really need to want to work in finance. Number two, knowledge. You got to know something about it, right? Number three, analytical skill, including critical thinking ability and quantitative skills these days. And four, street smart. Those are, the, in general, those are the four things that people look at. The most important software is your drive. The most important hardware is your critical thinking ability. Okay, let's go from the drive first. If I ask most people, why do you wanna get a finance job? The majority of them, if they tell the truth, is to make money. Nothing wrong with it. That was precisely the reason I got this job. I was a Caltech, I was dirt poor. And I didn't wanna do um, academic work. I wasn't interested. And you know, if industry work, I was looking at it. I just said, you know, I don't, I don't want to go to Silicon Valley. I don't want to be a, a researcher. It feels like the same thing as a postdoc. Um, so I want to do business. And if I do business, the, the, the highest paying job or either investment bank or management consulting. So I picked investment bank. But very, very soon I find in a finance servicing job. If you want to be successful, if you want to do well, there is, you're going to go through hell. You're going to have an environment so high pressure that the process of making money will take away all the love for you to spend money. You lose the desire of spend money. That's not me. That's many, many people told me the same thing. So if you only come here for the money, and the things that money can bring you, you, are, you find a job that defeated the purposes. So the only way, that's why, you know, we all interview people, ask them that question, even though we know making money is a huge factor, we want to see something else because we knew that making money as a factor will go away so fast that you don't even feel it. It, when, once it's gone, once it's gone, you'll quit. You will never have a good career. You'll quit. The only people stay are the people who love it. One way or the other, they love it. So, you know, and in terms of drive, I tell you a small story, little story. You know, when I was a Credit Suisse, one year, we decided we're going to recruit from Caltech. Because we figured, you know, why, why don't we ever go to Caltech? They're a bunch of smart people. And since I graduated from there, I went there. I interviewed 19 people. And of course, being Chinese, I want to bring a Chinese kid back, of course. But none of them, every one single one of them failed at that, uh, at this question. I have to ask them, you know, other than tell me about yourself, ask them, you know, why do you want to get a finance job? The answer always in general, well, I'm smart. I'm a very analytical person. I have great analytical skills. I have great quantitative skills. And therefore, I, I, like, I want to get a finance job. Well, this is almost like, I ask you, why do you like to swim? You tell me you have long legs. Well, if you have long legs, you could be running too. You don't have to swim. That's not. the you, you being qualified has nothing to do with you liking the job. You got to give me a chance to understand why you like the job. And in fact, the most important thing is that not only you need to like the job, you need to convince me that you like the job. How do you convince me? Well, if you like finance job, have you been reading Financial Times or Wall Street Journal every day? I read it. I still do it. I spend half an hour to an hour read Financial Times every, every day. I learn a lot from it. Are you paying attention to central bank policies? Are you paying attention to racial quality? problems? Are you paying attention to physical policies? Are you paying attention to the virus development in India, in Brazil, in Chile, in Europe? Are you learning all this? Are you listening? Are you talking to people about this? Are you investing stocks yourself? 
So all of this, you can tell me everything that you love it. I will just ask you, what have you done about it? So that is the preparation work that you need to do. If you need to convince me that you have the drive, you first of all have to convince me you like to do it. This is something you would like to do. You know, have your parents um, subscribe to Wall Street Journal, probably many of them already done, already have, or Financial Times, and read it. If you find that you can't read it, maybe this job isn't for you. Maybe this is not the industry you want. If you find that every year, every day you, you draw into it, maybe this is. So by convincing yourself, you will be very, it will be very easy to convince the me. And it's okay if you want to make money. You know, take $100, take $500 maybe, even $100, buy some stocks, invest, get a little bit, get into Bitcoin, whatever, and follow the market. It's so all of this. This is the way for you to find out and this is the way for you to convince the people who want to hire you that you do have to try it. You really need to like it. So second, so the first one is drive. Second, knowledge. Once you have the drive, you naturally will go for knowledge. You will, you know, you're in college. Every college will have microeconomics, macroeconomics, corporate finance. This is, if you're interested, you go to these classes. You're not gonna be a total biology major or chemistry major, have never done any class in finance or economics and tell me, I love it. Well, what have you done with it? Have you actually get any proper training of it? Have you talked to professors about it? Have you done any research of it? Have you done any projects about it? So knowledge, learn some knowledge. Third, analytical skill. This is really, really important. Well, first of all, let me talk about quantitative skill. There are many books that, you know, Chinese usually are, are fine with quantitative skills. It's in general, our, our family, our culture. Um, and also there are many books helping you for quantitative study, quantitative study for quantitative interviews. I don't know the name by, the, by themselves, but if you're in any of the schools, just ask um, your, your older um, last, you know, whoever's graduated, find a job. They, they more likely than not have seen those books. What's, what's hard is critical thinking about it. That's the part, remember I was talking about why I love finance. The major, major thing for me was intellectual challenge that you face a brand new world almost every single day and you face a brand new problem every single day and you need to solve it. And nobody has solved it that day or nobody has known how to do it. And you need to come up with a way to decompose the problem and solve the problem. That is critical thinking ability. You need to have that ability. You need to be able to take a raw problem and decompose it, put on a structure and come up with a roughly good, reasonable solution. That's incredibly important. And I have to say, you know, this is gonna be hard for undergrads. This is what PhDs are trained for. This is what MBA or JDs are trained for. I had conversation with my um, friends who are lawyers. They do the same thing. It's very interesting. When they take a case, they decompose it. They put in the framework. They think about all the technicalities. The, the ability, what I call it, is the, the ability to think. Now you have to ask me, how do I train for this? It's hard. So for me, um, I train myself through PhD time. My first day uh, into grad school, my advisor, who's a Buddhist, told me, look, this is almost like meditation. You have to think. And one day, your eyes will open. It only took me four and a half years, maybe five, to open my eyes. And out of, during the process, I failed two to three pro subjects. Um, and luckily, before I graduate, I got it. Somehow you just, you will get it. What helps me 
and it will help you is somewhat, I think, um, if you, you guys have uh, people ap apply for management consulting, there are these kind of interviews called case studies. Case study could be like, okay, um, Pepsi Cola, Pepsi just started a new, um, new drink. Why don't you, how can you design a, um, you know, marketing tool for marketing um, process for this new drink? Or as easy as take a restaurant downstairs. How much money do you think they make a night? So simple idea like that, commercial ideas. It's not as much as dynamic system that I talked about before, but it's almost, it's also like in a static setting, but you need to put a framework to a raw problem. So once you can solve the static problem, you can then move on to dynamic problem. So I studied these problems for a year. I prepared my interview for a year in the interview group. I guess you can similar, do similar. It will definitely help. It will definitely help. But really the very solid way is effectively, you gotta go through this, um, it just goes through this, um, um, the, the, the train, go through the pain. So that is, analytical skill. So drive, knowledge, analytical skill, and then street smart. Street smart is interesting. Either you have it or you don't have it. You know, it's, and in fact, it's not exactly that important. To, for certain jobs, it's, it's okay. If you're looking for a home trading job, you probably don't need it. But if you're looking for sales job, you definitely need it. For so any jobs, maybe banking job, you probably need it. Um, for any job that you have to deal with people, oftentimes in a very fast paced uh, human interaction, you probably need some. Um, but the key is you need to understand, do you have it? Like, I don't consider myself has a lot of, have a lot of street smart. So I shy away from these jobs and do something else. But if you, you know, think you, you have it, so you can give it a try. So these are the four things, drive, knowledge, analytical skill, and then street smart. Now, these lead you into the door. What about success? Success comes all time. In financial industry, there's no one personality determines whether or not you can success or not. Some introvert do incredibly well, such as Bill Gross himself. Some extrovert do incredibly well, I guess, you know, I don't know if he's an extrovert, but the, the Goldman CEO, he's a drummer. Oh, no, actually he's a DJ. So, you know, for someone who's in clubs all the time, I, I hope he's an extrovert, otherwise he'd probably kill himself. So it doesn't matter. But I think what these are would be personal fit, personality fit, first one. You have to find a place that fits your personality, find a job that fits your personality. Like myself, I never envision myself be a quant trader, just, just because I don't like to be in the office and like a grad school time and you know like a grad student all the time. I just don't like it. I liked more of human interaction, probably not too much, but I like certain amount of human interaction. You need to fit personality. And secondly, again, the critical thinking ability. I've never seen someone successful does not have critical thinking ability. It's one of the strongest, strongest traits of success. And third, this is something often as Chinese often lacks on risk taking mentality, not risk taking capacity, but mentality. You have to be risk seeking. You have to be seeking the uncertainty. You have to enjoy uncertainty. This is not about you buy a stock or not buying a stock. This is including, do I talk to my manager about this? Do I raise my hand for this new project? Do I look at this new business and am I the person to take it over? Do I look at 
another job opportunity? Do I jump so that into a completely unknown environment, but probably give me a lot of upside? Or do I stay at my current place to continue to work on the foundation of my franchise, my own personal brand? Everything in finance is fast. Everything in finance is risk. You have to be willing to take risk. Just to think you're going to do a good job and be promoted and do well, it's impossible. People will step away. So you need to want it. You need to go for it, search for it, and take risk. That doesn't mean do it in a very, um, I guess, in the in the in the in the uncalculated way, just you know, bluntly taking risks. No, everything needs to be calculated. But once you calculate, you gotta take the uncertainty. You gotta walk into the unknown. Everybody who did well had those three, I think. They fit their personality, fit the environment. They have very strong crit critical thinking ability and then they are willing to take risk. So these are the first two sector sections. Um, one is financial industry, service industry, the overlook. And then one is a key skill set. Now I'm gonna move on to the last part, the job searching process. The job searching process has three components in there. Resume, networking, and interview. Let me first go over with you how a bank hire people, how a bank hire a college person, let's say. For a bank to hire a college person, there are two kinds of colleges they look at. Certain amount of kind of college is called their feeding school. Certain kind of college is called, I guess, non-feeding school. It's not necessarily who's good, who's bad, but in general, IVs are almost always their feeding school, but doesn't mean like non-feeding schools are bad. Caltech was never a feeding school to anybody. The feeding school, they would in general send people over, give presentation, talk to the students, collect resume. The non-feeding school, you have to probably go through an internet online process to submit your resume. But however it is, your resume, will go into a resume, basically a resume um, stack, a stack of resume, a resume book in a way. Now, HR people take this resume, these resumes, thousands of them, they will look through it and they will probably pick 200 to 300 or maybe even less, maybe 200, I guess, more like 200 and 300 and make a formal book and give it out to all the desks. Investment banking will have a resume book. Sales will have a resume book. Trading will have it. Research will have it. IT will have it. Risk will have it. Young compliance probably have it. And then the people who work on the desk will then look at this book to circle the, the name that they like. They look through the resume and circle out the name. These are the people who will in general get a chance to be called back as an interviewer. You will get an interview. Statistically, my guess is for every resume sent it out, the chance of getting an interview is less than 10%, maybe even less than 5%. But once you are called, I guess the chances go up. Conditional on your call, the, the chances go up to 25, maybe even 50%. And oftentimes, the, um, somebody said they can't hear me. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So for a undergrad, the key point and also for first year graduate, master's student, the key point is their third year or the master student, if they're first year and second year, the key point an internship of their after their first year. Their third year internship is incredibly important because once you're in the internship, 
let's say your internship for Goldman Sachs. In general, it becomes a three months of interview process within the firm as you work. And from there, um, you will probably get, they will keep at least 75 to 80% of the interns as their next year's full-time analyst. So if you miss that third year, the chances of when they open up for full-time recruiting next year, there are only 20% of spots left or maybe even less. So you really need the third year. At the end of the third year, you really need a good intern. Some people started from freshman year, to be honest. I know people from started from freshman year and then the sophomore and then junior. And so that's in general the process. But if you look at the process, let me go over with you. What are the important points of that? So first of all, from the statistics, you can probably see the the hardest thing in this whole process is actually to get interview. It's really to get interview. And once you get interview, many things you can at least give us get a chance to present yourself. Otherwise, you only have one piece of paper. You know, for your everything, your colorful personality, your 20 years of life, one piece of paper. You can't show much, right? So how do you get, how do you enhance your chance from say 5% to 10, 15, 25% to get to the interview round? You have to spend time in both resume and network. So, okay, let's talk about resume. Resume. If you look at the whole process, the resume, the key point many people don't understand is the resume has to be a layered resume. Your resume needs to give people enough of your information within 10, 15 seconds of time. If you miss that window, you're out. Reason being, think about it, an HR person. If he and she spent two minutes on, another, on one resume, which is already pretty fast, one hour, 30 resumes. Eight hour, 240 resumes. A week, 1,200 resumes. So for thousands of resumes they get, this person needs to go over like two to three weeks to be able to read through these resumes, to pick 200 to 300 resumes. And then once this person gives this 200 resumes to the desk, desk has work. So the desk person will probably spend an hour on 200 resumes. That gives you maybe 20 seconds of resume on average to be seen. So if you cannot, if you cannot attract people's attention within 15 seconds, you are out, I guarantee you. So how do you do that? You have to use different fonts. You have to sell yourself in the most obvious way. How do you sell yourself? Okay, resume, there are four pieces, pretty much. Education, experience, extracurriculum or social um, work, hobbies. Education, hard to differentiate. You go to MIT, great. Everybody else is Harvard, MIT, Columbia, these are your competitive pool though. Now, Ivy was just the step, start. Now, if not Ivy as a start, don't be discouraged. I tell you a story. There was one time when I was Credit Suisse, we went to, um, we went to um, a recruiting trip, a lot of us, led by the big boss. And so, you know, after the recruiting, we went to dinner, all MDs, at least MDs on that, on that, on that table. And he was like, look, we are hiring all these IV people. Um, let's see where, which school we all came from. Everybody talked about our schools. None of us 
or from IV. Now, this is not to say IV League people don't make big, don't make it far in the investment bank. What it's saying is that non-IV people has equal, easily an equal chance. The reality is by the time you get into the bank, within a month, nobody will ever ask you where you come from. The things that I just talk about, the qualities, the thinking process, that leads you in there. And actually, I'm gonna answer a quick question. I just I just added seeing the non-finance major students, nobody cares. Nobody cares what major you are. You know, remember what I what I what I write here, this key skill set. It doesn't need to be finance people. No, not at all. I need good quality people, not finance. So, okay, education, you can't stand out. Experience, you have to have something. Maybe you have certain things that you project you've done with very close to what we do, or certain things you're doing are very, just very interesting. You know, you go through, uh, you work with somebody or you work with some company, um, or then social, um, activity, extracurriculum, clubs, um, things that like that. You know, we are looking for people who fit in. You know, unfortunately, being able to play violin very well does not count. But if you can play chess very well, that certainly counts. That's that kind of environment now. And then hobby, you can certainly stand out in hobby. And you know, every, that's one thing that of, oftentimes people forget to write, but that's often one thing you can score points. So out of these, your resume will be very, you know, neatly write it and with all the details. No, you have no chance. I only look at 10 to 15 seconds. If I can 10 to 15 seconds find something I'm interested in, then I'm going to spend 30 seconds on it. Look at the little, the next layer of information. If I look at that next layer of information that's interesting, I look at more. Once I spend two minutes on it, your resume is in already because I've already spent that much time. I, I, I feel you are interested. You're interested. So that is the key of writing resume. And to be able to write a good resume, you have to be able to sell. It's a marketing process. You have to write things. The format is okay. The format, you can go to any career development center, but you have to sell things, sell for things Basically, it's a piece of paper for people to look at it and say, wow, this person is interesting. I want to talk to him. That's it. This person is interesting. It's not necessarily this person is smart. It's all more this person is interesting. So that's about it. But then resume. However it is, you still look at it. You still have, you know, a lot of competition, like I said. Um, the next step is networking. The easiest way or the most direct way or the highest probability way to get your picked for interview is to someone internally be able to tell you, to tell HR, look, I met this kid. I really like him. Let's interview him. Almost no HR will say no, you get your interview. But for someone to say that, it, it, there's responsibility on that person. Because by the time you get an interview, even if it's the CEO who recommended you, he might not have more leeway because anybody with the interview process can get you. So there's responsibility. So what do you do? on network, how do you sell yourself to someone internally? There are two components that you can do. Two things you can do. One is on campus, one is off campus. So on campus, if you're one of those schools, you're very lucky that you are the feeding school of Wall Street. They will send a bunch of people there. They will 
you know, open up a, or oftentimes it's open space, um, you know, have drinks, you know, everybody dress nice. You go there, their all full purpose was to introduce you about to the fur, to know, to understand the fur. So what you do is you go there. The tricky part, however, is they are not there to interview. So if they're in there to interview, you can answer questions. So you can you can sell yourself, but you're not. They're not. They're not going to interview you. It's you to interview them. It's you to ask questions to them. You have to find the questions when you ask and leave an impression to them. So without being interviewed, you need to sell yourself. That's the tricky part. Of it. That's the hard part. So. I know one of the uh, students I, I, I used to work with, and she told me a trick. First of all, okay, you have to do research, right? You have to do research. You have to do, um, um, you have to understand the company. You have to know what has happened to the company and why, you know, um, what kind of department you're interested in, who are the department that came, uh, what does this company the department do recently? What has happened? And you have to prepare also small talks. So once you study it, she will bring a phone open as a rec recording booth. She'll go on and talk to these people, but record everything she talked about. And when she gets home, of course, you'll get the business card. You can She'll take notes on who she talked to and what they talked to. And then she'll write thank you letter to these people and to basically um, thank them and remind them who you are. Really remind them who you are. The job of these people to go on campus is that they need to go back and tell HR, oh, I met so-and-so, I think this kid is good. This is in fact their job. They need to do this. So if you get make their job easy, and in fact, after she successfully led her job, she became a recruiter in her own company. She turned around and went back to, to Columbia and, and become a recruiter. And then she figured out, she figured out one thing. She said, the person we eventually wanted to give interview to, and the person not only got one interview, and in fact, the person who got their job, are often not the most, the sharpest people, the most smart people, but the people who love our job the most, who's most enthusiastic, who you can tell, who, who love our job, our department, and who belong here. So it's not about that much about your quality. Of course, you need to have good quality, but more about show your respect, show your enthusiasm, show your work and someone used to tell me when you write thank you letter write twice three times you know why because the first time nobody reads thank you letters you think you wrote one and very beautifully you know they'll read it and be tears in, in, in their eyes and you know remember you and go wow this is great no nobody reads it nobody reads the first time but if you send the second time nobody sends second time by the way if you send a second time, I'll feel guilty if I open it, if I don't open it. If you send a third time, I feel like, wow, you have a question for me? Do we want to have a follow-up coffee? And there's nothing to show your enthusiasm, to show your respect, to show your drive more than that. So that's how you build a relationship, build a relationship by, you show people you really want it. You really want it and you study, work hard for this. So, so that's on-campus injury, on-campus networking. There's also off-campus um, networking. So off-campus networking are different, you know, a little bit different animals. These are, you know, many companies, even for a so store, many companies um, 
um, the many companies, they will, um, um, they might not have the time and, and resource to go to a school, even if you're good, good school or not good school. Like, you know, like I said, Caltech was never a feeding company and nobody ever comes. Other than, in fact, Goldman, Goldman always comes. Um, what you do is you need to find most likely alumni that work in the company. You can find them in LinkedIn or Korea Development Center. You can cold call them, send them emails. You know, what's the worst can happen? They piss off. They don't reply to you. You can always do it. Or through friends and family. What you actually end up doing is ask for a coffee chat. Ask for a coffee chat for the coffee is the same thing as on campus on campus networking event. You sit down, have a coffee, you ask about their company, you ask questions, what's happening in the company and do what. So you 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 need to prepare everything just like you're the income on, on, on campus. Now, if you're one of those schools that these banks don't go to, even if you are the schools that these banks go to. I know on average, a lot of people go to 50 to 100 of these coffee chats. I know this, 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 per, this, this girl that I helped over the time, she easily went to 50 to 100 of these coffee chats. She'll talk to anyone in the company. She's that thirsty. So this is how you show that you want this job. You wanted to get this. So that's network. And really within the company, if someone in the company is able to tell people, hey, let's give this kid an interview, much, much easier. So resume, networking, final interview. Interview process needs to be, a lot of people think interview process is question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. No, very, very wrong. Interview process is a conversation. The worst interview process can go is tell me about yourself. You go on for five, five minutes. By the first 30 seconds, I've already lost. By, the, by two minutes, I don't know what the hell you're talking about and I'm about, about to leave. So you, whatever question you come, you in general should have, especially on your resumes, you in general should have 15, 20 second kind of answer. But that answer needs to be designed so well that you kind of lead the interviewer to ask a question you want him to ask or her to ask. And then you can expand that 15 to 20 second answer into a one minute answer, but not longer. And then you lead that person into that subject. So that interview process is very, um, needs to be a very conversational process. Now I give you a, a example of um, how my, I got my first job. That was long, long time ago. Um, like I said, Caltech is not a feeding school. I didn't know anything a lot about Wall Street, almost anything. I, I did read a lot of newspaper, prepared, um, read some books about option pricing, um, you know, try, try to prepare. Um, Lehman Brother came to Caltech and they weren't even recruiting. They were just here to introduce their banks. And I, they, they had like two people, an MD and her, his assistant. Um, you know, after the talk, I went to you know, ask a few questions to the MD and got this business card. So all of a sudden, eventually, um, all of a sudden, my, 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 my CISA advisor came to me and said, hey, you know, I run out of um, funding in summer. Why don't, why don't you find an internship, maybe? And I was looking, oh, so fine, good. So I say, you know, what's my Wall Street connection? I don't, I don't have any. <laughs> um, and there, there weren't, really, there weren't uh, linking or anything like that. So I got this business card. I called this guy. First time I called, he was on, you know, he was on a business trip. Second time I called, he was on vacation. Third time I called, he was in India. 
And then the fourth time I called, and I don't know what, what was the excuse, the five time I called, um, I don't remember, but one day he actually called me back. He called me back. He said, you know, what can I do for you? He said, um, um, I, I said, you know, I'm looking for a job. He said, uh, okay, um, you know, my recruiting season is almost over, but I do need one quant researcher. Um, but I don't have funding to, to, to fly you to New York. So I'm going to give you a range of interview for you, 30 minutes. At that time, there's no Zoom, there's no anything. It's just a phone, phone interview, three people, same time, three, uh, 30 minutes. You can't even see the person. Um, go for it. So I did that. The first question, what was your thesis about? Look, my thesis is 200 pages long. If I go over half of my um, introduction, these people will all be sleeping already. So I told them, my thesis is about solving a um, differential equation, integral differential equation using numerical methodology. That was it, that was my answer. Oh, okay. So why does it make a thesis? You know, you work five years on it, just to solve an equation. I said, yeah, yeah, because you know, um, the hard part is um, the equation doesn't have an analytical solution. So you can't really solve analytically. So if you numerically, it takes a long time to solve it. Um, the computer time, uh, there isn't a fast enough computer in the world to solve this equation in the accuracy that, I, that we need. Okay, that's it. So now that he's interested. So what do you do? He said, I, I tell them, look, I, I make this, I can't solve my original equation. So I build another equation as a model equation. I proved the, 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 the relationship between these two equations, but the model equation, I can solve numerically. And I can do another analysis. Then I use analytical explanation to link these two. Bear in mind, every answer of mine gets longer slightly longer, but I never assume the other person has more than a college education, or in fact, more than a high school education. So you really need to dumb, dumb, dumb it down. So when they, um, when they look at when, so eventually they start asking me, then I went off, you can, you can be sophisticated. But the key thing is interview is a process to sell trust, to sell personality. The final decision for that person is never whether or not this person can do my job, can do this job, because you can. The fact that you are picked as interview for this interview means you can do this job already because how hard it is to be picked in this. It's very hard. So by the time you get it, you walk into that door, they know you can do the job. What they need to know is whether or not they are interested, they are willing to sit next to you for eight, 12, 16 hours a day and not kill themselves or, and be happy to work with you. So that's, what you need to sell in an interview. You sell a trust, you sell a personality, but at the same time, always remember every interview is a two street, two way street. You need to see whether or not that is the group you want to work at. Remember I say that the, 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 the success trace, the number one, personality fit. If you don't fit, your personality don't fit in that group, you will never be successful. You will actually suffer. So you need to figure out whether or not you want their job without them knowing what. Your job is to get that job, but be very, very clear that whether or not you want this job or not. So that pretty much concludes it. Oh, last thing, how to prepare interview. You need to have a group. 
you need to have a group of a few friends, similar background, similar interest, and practice, 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 practice. Um, I, I practice for a year when I look for my job. Um, I think many students these days, they started the job searching process for the first day they entered the college. I heard stories like that, pretty scary, but that's what the competition is like. So, you know, form a group, practice. And that is it. Um, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dan. I've been typing like crazy, trying to take notes and uh, feeling reassured that I will be able to uh, revisit and uh, for anything I've missed on YouTube. Uh, there are a lot of great discussions already in the chat. I'm sure you also noticed, I saw you were looking at the- No, direction. I haven't, I couldn't see much. So. Yeah, there are a lot of discussions and Angie have been helping to answer some of the questions as, as well. So uh, I want to just uh, dive right into it. So one of the question is, um, you talk about street smart. Can you elaborate a little bit on it? Give an example, maybe. Okay. Um, you on on the trading floor. This is this is often the case on the trading floor, or on the um, um, finance job is a lot about people job. You know, there are oftentimes other than even for the quant trading job where you you know work like a research group, it's about people, and oftentimes the way to measure success or failure are relative. You're just going to have to be fair. And there's there are a lot of money involved. There's a lot of conflict involved. Now, if you think about it in a very direct sense, if I'm a trader and I'm a salesperson, I look at my trader, okay? A client wants to sell 100 share of Amazon and the trader bought it. In the next five minutes, one of these people will lose money, right? So it's, even though the client wants to sell and the trader wanted to buy, one of them will lose money within five minutes. So a natural conflict will be there. And you're just gonna have to watch over your shoulder on many things that could come. And sometime, you know, be mindful. And, you know, that's, that's part of it. And also certain time in the, you know, when you do a deal, on the phone, when people give you information, do you trust that information? Do you believe things that they say? You know, my wife was just telling me a story about, you know, their, their firm talking about looking at money laundry situation. And, and she asked me, what do you think is the best money laundry place? I don't know. I said, no. She said, Tobos. Like, you know, if you open a Tobos on it, nobody knows how much money you get every, every year or every day. You can just fund those through a bunch of money. So finance market, there are many things like that. People give you information. People give you incomplete information, people intentionally give you different kind of information, misleading information, it happens a lot. You, if you don't trust anybody, you never go anywhere. If you trust everybody, you blow up. So there's always a fine line. The same thing with, um, same thing with your boss your you know, subordinate or your, um, or your manager, how everybody view you, what kind of situation you're in, gotta be, you know, that's the street smart you have to, you have to understand. It's very subtle. Yeah, thanks again. And, and I agree, it's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of practice and maybe reading books and being through situations and maybe work with a coach and talk to a mentor. Yeah. There are a lot of things that you can do on yeah. that front. And yeah. in the very beginning, I saw a very good question. You talk about scalability. 
with the influx of talents into this industry, have that reduced scalability? What's your view on that? Influx of talent, I don't think it will reduce scalability. If anything, I think more likely will be more of winner takes all. Mm -hmm. It's very, in fact, what's interesting about the financial market is the single biggest um, determinant factor um, among financial firms is regulation. As you can see from banks, American banks are dominating the market now. And because the European banks just constantly have their hands tied up. So the scalability that American banks can achieve is tremendous. And in fact, the influx of, of, um, of talent, what it does oftentimes is automation, just like every other industry is taking off cost. More and more costs are being taken off. And uh, going back to the part when you were mentioning about networking, there are a few questions related to that I think um, I'd like to follow up on. One is you mentioned sending thank you letter, not just once, but twice, even third times until the person feel obligated to open your email and reply to you. So to do that, what do you recommend is the right interval to do so without annoying that person? And uh, a week. A week, and then you should I send your first thank you letter the, the second day, and then a week after. But right. don't write it the same thing, though. Yeah, I mean you have to write it a little bit different, right? Yes. Either ask a new question or you know just just somewhat try to build a relationship. Try to in, you know not impress that person, but leave an impression to that person. Yeah, I agree, and. Uh... Uh, what about physical letters? Do you think you have to actually no, send notes? So. I don't need it. Nobody, nobody reads these physical letters anymore. I agree. Especially in this world, you yeah, don't yeah. even know if he will be in the office to open up the yeah, mailbox. Exactly. So email would, will work very yeah. well. Yeah. Although if nobody does it, you, you might as well send, send it. It's, it's probably nothing wrong. Yeah, it's just I've, a little bit old fashioned and people will, might take it the wrong way. So yeah, probably not. I'll say probably not. Yeah, and after you established that initial connection with this person, had a coffee chat, and that went well, and you did a follow up. How do you keep the relationship warm? Okay, very. You know, it, it depends. But simply, for instance, when you when you go through like COVID, mm -hmm. you know, check up on this person. You know, how are you doing? Are you okay? You know, how's family? And you know, I've been. You know, or you guys must have talked about some, 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 some things, find some common interest. Oh, I was ski, I was thinking about you. We talked about ski the other day, stuff like that. Naturally, not just, you know, get to the person, oh, I needed this and I need that, but naturally, hey, I, I thought about you. You know, this thing happened. We talked about this, remember we talked about this earlier. You, you say you love this movie. This actor is, is, is in this movie, it's just fantastic. I thought about you. That just feels warm feels very warm, it feels very natural. Um, and, and, and people appreciate things like that. I agree. So make the connection more personal level yes. and feel the connection when you don't need it right away. Yes, very right. Everybody knows where you, what you want, what you want, right? But even that, it makes a difference. Agree. And based on our experience working with more junior, I mean, most of them, all of them very smart employees, what is the biggest pitfall that you've seen them make and what bothers you most? What bothers me most is that many of the young generation, in fact, and you know, many of the us, even the old generation, many people believe work Working is just working. They don't realize working is to provide a service, not only to your clients, but also to your coworkers. Your job is to provide a experience 
a servicing experience to other people, to make other people happy. That's your value to your coworkers, to your boss, to your subordinate, and to your clients. It's not the difference of working and school are that school, you get homework, you finish the homework, you give to the, give to the professor and then he grades it, happy days, you go home. Working, you cannot work as you're doing homework. You have to treat yourself as a business. Yourself as a business to provide service to other people. And only when you are valuable to other people, your service is valuable to other people, then can you ask for something to, in, in, in return? That work is, is not like school. I hand in homework, I get an A. No, oftentimes you hand in the work, great work, you get a D because your service is not A. That is a great point. That's why sometimes we do see those A students might not actually be you know, the ones that are the top performers and rise up the fast in the workplace because they have not really switched their mindset into this, you know, building themselves as a business, build, building a brand and providing value to others. Yeah. And in uh, fact, you know, a lot of, a lot of very smart students, they, they're smart ever since they were five years old. Everybody around them tell them they're smart. And then by the time they get to school, they, they get to work. The only person they know is themselves. And these people get hurt a lot. Right. Their ego probably need to be contained and to learn how to work with others, right? To, to, because in the, in the workplace, most likely you, are, you have to be collaborative as well. Collaborative and, and really just you know, think about yourself as a service provider. You provide a service. You are a business in itself. And uh, we, a lot of people are very interested in, in your background. Some are asking, how do you speak such great English? And some others are asking, you know, you are a math PhD and you, you should be very good in quant and tech. And what other first five years when you were in the financial industry, what other books you've been reading and what other training you have, you have been taking? Can you share your... Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't have the, you know, the knowledge side when I, when I got in, into it. And, and in fact, my wife was, um, at the time, interestingly enough, my wife was uh, getting an MBA from NYU. Um, so she has a lot of textbooks. I just took every single one of her textbooks and read it, you know, in term, in, including micro, my, microeconomics, macroeconomics, corporate finance, I just took the book from read them from first page to the end, to, to, to the end. I, I, I'm kind of, I don't know any smart way to read a book. I just do it. Um, I, I couldn't say which book teach me what, but after you read like all these books, it's kind of naturally uh, accumulated. In terms of English, I guess you just have to have to work on it. Because when I, when I came to the, to, to, to the U.S., you know, um, there was a, um, speech test uh, at Caltech. I scored the lowest point among all international students. So I was that bad. Um, they actually sent me to like an English lesson. And I, and I, since then I started going to like different parties and, and also in, in the jobs. I had a sales side job. You have to talk to people all the time. You travel, um, you know, I, 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 you, at some point one year I used up all my passports. Um, passport pages, one year, I traveled this much. So, you know, naturally, if you talk to a lot of people, you just, you just get better. It doesn't matter if your, your accent is good or not. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I, I have Chinese accent, but as, as long as you're fluent and people understand you, um, that, that's fine. So a lot of practice, you know, very intentional practice and use it a lot in the work, in the workplace. And it's more about your, how you can express yourself uh, succinctly and efficiently and effectively, not, not so much about having the perfect accent. No, no, no. Nobody cares about accent, to be honest. You know, nobody cares about accent. I mean, 
Um, but also I read every day. Um, I read Financial read. Times mm -hmm. um, every day, 30 minutes to, to an hour. So a lot of jargons, a lot of ways people talk about it, how people talk about these things, um, you naturally get trained. Um, there isn't one thing that you do to, to, to improve, but it's all kind of things that you have to do it every day. Yes. So the important thing is to do things consistently every day. Oh, yeah. There's no this one book like where you can read and no. be the best in Kung Fu. No. It's not like that. No, that's not like that. that that's what I, what I say by drive because I like this stuff. I love this stuff. I, I'm very curious about these things. So every day I will feel like my day isn't over if I haven't read that newspaper. I haven't read anything like people thought about. There are many thinking pieces. There are many great thinkers in FT or Wall Street Journal that you can learn and absorb every single day. Um, How do you filter the most important information though? We are living in an information overload uh, society. And for me to read in the financial time, that might not take me half an hour. It might be half a day. So how, how what, what are your uh, I, I I almost read it as if it's kind of interesting. Like oftentimes it, it has nothing to do with anything. Like I, I would read a lot, you know, certain things, certain view in your mind is, is being built up. So you're looking for evidence to support or disprove, to prove or disprove your view. Um, so, but, but others, you just read it, you know, for instance, today I read um, if they're going to be able to um, uh, flip Trump's uh, CFO. You know, really, it has nothing to do with anything. It was just gossip. And I'm kind of interested about this kind of gossip. So I read, I spent like maybe 15, 20, 20 minutes, read a long paper, falling fall asleep like twice, but I, but I read it. It's just, it's just gossip. All these gossip, by the time it gets into your brain, at some point, it, something comes up. I don't know. When I read it, I don't know if it's useful. Most, most times not, but I just feel like it's gossip. It's, it's kind of interesting and curious. And a related question is how not to be a skeptic by reading so many different sources. I guess you have to apply your critical thinking ability as well when you are digesting all these information. Oh, that's the heart. I, I kind of, you know, I, I stopped reading WeChat um, news because there, there, there are too many like uh, fake news one way or the, the other. I tend to read, only get my news from FT. Um, if there's anything, I will double check from CNN and Fox News and just make sure like, even though they'll talk about the same thing from a different angle, but at least they will talk about the same thing. So that's the way I can get these. But these days you can't trust, um, trust most of the, 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 the talks. So I, I, don't, I don't spend time. I don't even open these, these files. Um, so it saves me a lot of time. Yeah. A rule of thumb is if you see your title is that is, you know, elicit your, uh, your worry or, or your anger or those strong feelings, that's most likely some, some yeah, over-exaggerated. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, I to, I'm, I'm in the middle. I don't get offended reading, watching CNN or Fox News. It's just, it's just they, they have different ways to, to talk about things. But at least you get a different angle. In fact, on my, in my car, I, 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 watch, I, I listen to CNN and Fox News. They're, they're next to each other. That helps, right? Yeah, they helps. balance each other out. I know they balance each other out. You kind of you kind of see the, the 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 important topics for both sides. How do you handle stressful situation at work? Work out. Um, work out. Work out. You have to work out, and then um, um, you have to leave your time. Leave, leave time for you. Be disciplined. Leave time to get a, get leave work. You can't be working all the time. I think if I learn anything over the time is that you should not be busy. Mm -hmm. You should definitely not be busy. Do a lot of things, but do not be busy. Leave yourself enough thinking time. Um, um, you know, but be Meditation? Busy. I tried. Um, I don't have a good teacher. Um, in fact, I don't have any teacher. Um, so <laughs> I tried. Um, a little bit time consuming. I ra I'd rather uh, get on my bike and 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 watch a sitcom or uh, 
a, a movie. I watch a lot of movies, so that helps. Love it. Uh, David, I think you know from your uh, time at Crest Swiss, he asked a question about for someone who is getting their first job out of college and asking how to decide between banking versus tech, what would be your suggestions? Uh, depends on our personality. Mm -hmm. You will feel they're, they're distinct. These are probably two very distinct working environments. When you interview, you will find, you will feel like you belong to one group and just go with that group. There is no good or bad. So maybe you can try to talk to people from both industries doing those informational yeah. interview and coffee yeah. chats yeah. and yeah. understand their day to day and try to see if that's something that would attract you. That's true. That's true. I mean, you find like a lot, a group of people just like you, then you just join them. Makes sense. Um, another question is, wow, we're getting a lot of questions flowing in right now. Do you think you blend into the American culture here? Um, knowing counterparts background could be helpful when you were doing sales pitch or going to visit clients. Have you done anything special to uh, know more and to connect with them such as following you know, football or other sports events? I think um, I'm, I'm actually one of those who don't really believe um, glass ceiling. I don't believe glassy. I do believe cultural difference. And I think many of the glass ceilings are a reflection of cultural differences. But cultural difference should not stop people from being promoted. There are plenty of cultural difference between Indians and American Americans. And you, you see how well Indians have done in both tech and finance. And even my, you know, the, 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 in my career, in fact, I was helped mostly by Indian people. Um, you see how they survive, you see how they thrive, you see how they help the next generation. They actually were able to hold on to what they believe. You know, you go to their party, their party is still very much like they had in India. But that didn't stop them from being becoming the CEO of major American companies or running major business in investment banks. So I think cultural, you don't really need to blend in, but you should need to find a way to communicate. And um, I just feel like maybe at least the first generation, we were not trained that way. The Indian people here, they are more um, trained by the English um, education system. So to them, they, even though they have their own Indian culture as you know, race or um, uh, religious culture, their professional culture are very similar to, you know, um, English or um, American. I, I think that's if that's if there's anything that Chinese can learn, that's probably what we need to work on. I don't believe glass ceiling. The pure the reason is it's really very much about. Um, it's really very much about. Um, trust. You know, ask any Chinese would would you would you promote anybody you don't trust from your from your your own subordinate? You won't. In China, you wouldn't. Among Chinese, you wouldn't promote anybody who you don't trust. So, if you can't build a trust between your non-Chinese manager and you, then the chances of getting promoted and to break that so-called glass ceiling is incredibly low. Just because, not because they are American or Indian, just because they don't trust you. Even if they're Chinese, they, they won't trust you. They won't promote you. So this is not about race. This is not about building a trust, building an environment, building communication. I agree. 
Yeah, building trust is super important and uh, depends on your personality, depends on your interests. Just uh, be curious about the other person and find something in common. And uh, I think a good tip that I've heard is that people always want to talk about themselves. So maybe ask about their hobbies and their interests and be really engaged with that conversation. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, a lot of things and also when you go through and not only hobbies or sports events, in business, it's very easy to see how things play out. Business is all about interest, exchange of interest. Always have other people's interest in mind. Not necessarily do the handing the perfect homework. Again, provide a service. Thank you so much. And we still have many questions on answer, on answer but we are proposing 11.30. Thank you for uh, like 400 people still with us tonight. Uh, and uh, thank you again for, you know, really sharing your time with us. And uh, for those of you who would like to join the, you know, join the chat group to continue the discussion, you might have already seen the QR code on the screen. So thank you so much, Gan. Before we thank depart you. for tonight, do you have some final words to share with our audience? Take a risk. Life is short. The worst thing you can do is to, under, to, as a young person, is to know where you're going to be in the 25 years of time. Take a risk. Success or fail, just at least go for it. Thank you so much, yep. Wang. And on thank that you. note, <laughs> thank you very much for yep. sharing with us uh, this insights tonight. And thank you all the audience for uh, spending your Thursday evening Thank you with very us. much, everybody, um, thank to you. spend all this time with me. <laughs> And, and again, thank you, um, Wisdom Academy and uh, uh, Chinese Coffee Cup. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dugan. I think your friend, Baby Zhang, is also here to supporting you. And we are your friends. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. all people. And then you can uh, scan again uh, and then enter the chat. By the way, last month, Dr. Hu also gave us a macroeconomic talk. So if you go to Chinese Coffee Club YouTube, you can find his wonderful talk. I think that night is also over 500 people. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you and great host here tonight and also great speaker today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. I'm gonna continue. Bye.